Welcome to the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival, uh, one of the world's largest and oldest Jewish cultural events. My name is Andrea Siegel. I am the German Consul General in Miami, and I'm happy to continue our longstanding cooperation with the festival. Uh, and it is my great pleasure today to moderate a discussion with the German producer and director, Karl Ludwig Rettinger, uh, about his film Red Orchestra, which is premiering actually uh, in, at this year's festival. It has not yet been shown in Germany due to the pandemic. So I'm very happy to see, to greet Mr. Rettinger. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so the film, which is obviously a documentary uh, film about uh, an important German resistance network, actually an international one with uh, some chapters of the resistance in Berlin and Paris and, and Brussels, quite a complex uh, film. So what was your motivation actually uh, to, 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 uh, to, to take up this challenge? Yeah, I mean, the, the first, when I learned first about the Red Orchestra, which was just by chance in the 80s already, by a friend, I didn't know anything about it. It actually was a story which was not really publicly known, really. And um, also today, the knowledge is very limited about it, not only in Germany, but also in Belgium, in, in, in uh, France and in Israel. So when I heard about it, um, we I talked with a friend and we said it's 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 astonishing that uh, there is a public uh, memorials about different resistance groups in Germany against Nazis. There were not that many, but uh, some of them. But about the Red Orchestra, there is not really anything uh, uh, known publicly. Uh, there is no discussion about it, no knowledge. Uh, uh, and even in West Germany, Germany was still divided in the 80s. Um, they were more seen as traitors because one of the members of the Red Orchestra uh, was giving military information uh, to the Russians. And uh, we did not agree that you can call them traitors because uh, in the late 30s, early 40s, there was no chance to overthrow the Nazi regime from uh, inside opposition. This was impossible. So from my point of view, it's totally legitimate uh, to, to work together with a, with a military enemy uh, uh, to overcome the Nazi regime, even it was very important actually. So, and I, I thought it would be important to, to uh, do a film about this, but it was shortly after my studies, I studied in Berlin and it's such a complex on, uh, uh, project to make a film about them. And as you saw there, uh, finally I found some, uh, uh, feature film materials from Eastern Germany, Western Germany. I was not in the, in the situation that I could finance and handle a complex film like this. So it took quite a long time. I had to, I studied to work as a producer and uh, did some films by my own, but mainly earned my money as a producer of documentary films and Five years ago, I was in the position and I had the standing against uh, TV stations and uh, fundings to fund a film like this and to do it. Yeah, what, what is fascinating is that there are uh, several layers of the film uh, for, the, uh, for the audience. Uh, the, um, well, there's of course the, the real historical personalities which are sometimes shown in, in photographs and, and so on. Then you have these uh, two film productions, sort of historical film productions of the 19, late 1960s or early 1970s. One yes. is a GDR and one uh, series, short series, or I think a six sequence series uh, on the Western German television. And then you have the stories told by descendants of the respective families uh, of the individuals. 
um, and um, well, how how did you uh, come? Uh, I mean, across this idea, I, I understand that the films, uh, the historical films, uh, have played a big role in this. Yeah, I mean, I was not interested because most of the members of the Red Orchestra had been executed, and um, there were some descendants and. Of course, if you are working underground, there are very few photographs. There is just something like 20 seconds of film of a, of a marriage uh, of one member of the Red Orchestra. So, so I was not interested to do a, a, a talking head film. I think this is too abstract. And so the whole idea was on hold. And but I always was in contact after the reunification in Germany. A lot of new informations uh, came from Eastern German, uh, Germany from uh, um, uh, there. And th th then I found two fiction films, which were both shot 1970. One from East Germany, the Defa, and one from Ch uh, West Germany, Bavaria. And then I had the idea, these films, they are not really uh, um, correct in each aspect. But I thought if I reunificate these two fiction films, some scenes of them, and I around this, I have a documentary uh, layer. Uh, um, this this could be a very interesting film, not only about the Red Orchestra, but at the same time about the reception and the the, the memorial uh, of the uh, uh, Red Orchestra after the war, during the Cold War. So it has these two elements in it. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm I'm very fascinated also by by the historical dimension of this group. Um, I mean, the name, the English name, Red Orchestra, is not the exact translation from Rote Kapelle, which is the German original name that was given actually by the Gestapo to these various and to quite disparate uh, groups. Yeah. Uh, Kapelle, uh, in, as as I understand it, is a little bit more. Um, sort of less ordered uh, and less structured than an orchestra, and it's also smaller. Uh, so, um, and, and actually, these were relatively small groups in in different in different places. But one of the uh, highlights of the film is also to underline the fact that uh, they could have made historical contributions to world history if only their messages were being received more positively or with more acknowledgement by the Russians. Uh, Stalin apparently did not, uh, did, re did reject their information about an impending German attack on Russia and the British and the US um, uh, State Department and, and Secret Services also didn't want to, uh, to listen to them. Um, I think that that's a great, uh, uh, I think a great uh, message to retain from this from this film as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you could say it's also tragic because they put their lives on risk to get to this uh, informations and um, to transmit them. Uh, um, uh, you see the the, the name uh, Red Orchestra comes uh, 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 from the radio transmitters. So, so the guy who is running a radio transmitter is the pianist. And, uh, and the German uh, uh, in Berlin, they, they had all over Nazi Germany, all over Europe, they had receivers. And they, they collected strange uh, radio signals they could not decipher. And they saw still, even in Berlin, there are transmitters running, sending informations uh, we cannot decipher. So they gave these different transmitter stations. One was in Paris, uh, two were in Brussels, in Antwerp. Uh, they gave them the name, the Red Orchestra, you see. 
So, and they, they put together these groups all, all in one. Also, they were from different sides, but they collaborated on one hand to bring these information of the attack uh, toward Stalingrad, for instance, uh, uh, to the Russian military or secret service. And um, yeah, it's tragic that Stalin really ignored these informations because he thought for a long time that the UK, that the British Empire would be the main enemy against Russia. Uh, as, as most people will know, there was a treaty between uh, Nazi Germany and uh, the Stalinistic regime in Russia that they don't attack each other. So that's how uh, uh, the German army could invade uh, Poland and uh, Netherlands, Belgium, France. And then to the surprise of Stalin, Hitler decided to attack, uh, to invade Russia itself. And they were not prepared at all. So within three months, the German army was in front of uh, Moscow, like 50 kilometers away from Moscow. And it was luck that it was the worst winter uh, since uh, centuries um, that the Germans were not able to, to conquer Moscow. And of course, there was a fierce now they defend it. And uh, many Russian soldiers gave their lives to defend it. And this was the beginning of the end. And, and the uh, the emotional dimension, and but also I think the, the the research and historical dimension of the film is largely also on the shoulders of uh, Dr. Hans uh, Coppi Jr., uh, who who is the, the the son of one of the members who died in early in the early 1940s. Can you can you tell tell us a little bit about the collaboration with him? Yeah, of course, this was very close. He's the son of the radio operator of the Berlin Group. And uh, he was born in prison because his, both of his parents were in prison then. And his mother was already pregnant. He was born and uh, when he was uh, born, his father still lived. He was executely executed shortly after and um, his mother one, ha one half year after. And he, you could say, is the kind of, um, how do you say, doyen or, or mentor of the, of the memory of the Red Orchestra. He started, uh, uh, he changed his studies to become a historian when he was around 20. He grew up in uh, East uh, Berlin and he got in contact with all other family relatives of other groups, also people of the, of the Belgium and French group who were living in uh, uh, Israel and in the US partly, uh, in, in the UK partly. And he even, what was very important uh, during the Gorbachev era, uh, uh, when, when things opened up a bit in Russia, he was able to enter the archives of the Secret Service and um, he found uh, uh, also um, uh, Gorevich, one of the member, mem surviving members of the uh, Belgian group. And so, so he was a very important partner for this film. Without him, I would have not been able uh, to do it. He dedicated his whole life for it. Actually, I knew about him via this friend in the 80s. He was already in contact because in the 80s, it was already possible to, to go for a day to uh, East Berlin. So there were some first contacts, but it took so long to um, uh, actually do this film afterwards. And of course, after the reunification, the, the, the whole, the, the two different approaches to um, a history of, of the Nazi regime had somehow to deal with each other, you see? So it was, I think, an interesting process for him, but it was also very important for the West German uh, side, uh, historical side too. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about the different uh, personalities uh, involved. Uh, the uh, the two main uh, people are in the, in the German and the Berlin group, uh, Arvid Harnack and uh, Schulze Boysen, uh, and whereas the Brussels-based uh, activities were led by Leopold uh, Trepper and then Gurevich, or also renamed Kent uh, at some point. Um, they had they had different different uh, ideological background and also different operational background. Maybe you can you can elaborate a little bit yeah. on that. Yeah. So these two groups they did not know of each other until the late uh, until forty one. And um, on one side there was the Berlin group. These were people uh, a, a net of different circles of friends all together more than 100 people mainly located in Berlin who thought we need somehow to do something against this regime. They helped Jewish people and uh, uh, people who were needed to go out of, of Germany to get them out. They distributed flyers and so on. And two important members were Arvid Harnack and um, uh, Schulze Boysen, uh, um, Haro Schulze Boysen. And uh, Arvid Harnack, he actually studied for one year at the, he had a Rockefeller, uh, uh, what do you say, stipendium? I don't know the English. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the Wisconsin uh, University in Medicine. And there he met his later wife, uh, Mildred uh, Harnack Fish, and she went with him to Berlin. And uh, he was very close to the Communist Party, but uh, he became, uh, during the 30s, he became part of the... Um, Ministry of Finance. Uh, um, uh, so, and so they told him, "Don't you are rather should become member of the the uh, nationalist uh, National Socialist Party than uh, to to get some informations and so on." So he was very close. He had also some contacts to the Russian embassy. Uh, Haro Schulze Boysen was quite different. He he was not a kind of uh, um, straightforward uh, traditional communist. He was not convinced of the Leninist way of revolution. Ba ba ba. He was left, but much more open-minded. But when Harnack asked him, "We we need to help the Soviet Union because it's the only chance." to overthrow the Nazi regime, otherwise they might win the war, then Europe and Germany will be different for many centuries. So he was convinced and he, he then they collaborated and they gave these informations to the, uh, to the Russians. And there was a group in, in Belgium which helped them because their radio was not strong enough to get the information from Berlin to Moscow, they got from the em Russian embassy a radio system which only uh, uh, went till Minsk and the German army because the Russian army was not prepared within three weeks, they were past Minsk. So then from Brussels, somebody came to get these informations. And this was the Brussels group was uh, uh, established by Leopold Trepper. He's a very interesting personality. And um, he was born in, in a, a, a poor Jewish family in the south of Poland, uh, back then part of the uh, Hungarian uh, Austrian Empire. And he went, he was already there involved in strikes and so on. So he went to Palestine with the left-wing youth organization Hashomia Hatzea. And together there, there he met Großvogel, he met several people who, where he established this Russian, uh, this uh, uh, group in, in uh, Belgium. And he was already uh, in, in Israel, in Palestine in the late twenties and 
because he was, he had uh, his own organization, uh, um, um, I call Unity, because he thought it would be important that uh, uh, Jewish people coming, Jewish people who live already in Israel, in Palestine and the Arabs, they should work together and rather fight against the British occupants. Anyway, so he was kicked out and he got a part of the Russian secret service. He lived a few years in, in Russia and then he was sent to Brussels to uh, when the Russians started to uh, create um, a spy net all over Europe. So, and he, he was the only really professional spy, educated spy there. And he asked all his friends and old comrades from Palestine, they were all Jewish, to uh, work with him um, uh, to, to spy against the Nazi regime and collect military information. So uh, this is, I found very interesting because it's, uh, there was always the storytelling there was no resistance by Jewish uh, people. I mean, of course, in, inside of Germany, it was nearly impossible. But as you see, this was a very active group and there were also several people in, in uh, Paris too, uh, so who had all a Jewish background. And um, Trepper and Gurevich, he, uh, Gurevich he was later sent to the group. He was not in Palestine before, but he was also uh, Jewish, born in the Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, these are, I think, for our audience, very interesting details uh, uh, because the, the, the film itself does not put up front the Jewishness of, of these resistance, but as you say, uh, in particular, the Belgian uh, chapter uh, were mo mostly co constituted by, by Jewish uh, people. Um, another aspect which you deal with um, also not so profoundly, but I, I know that you have attached quite an importance to that, is the role of the women, uh, in particular Libertas, uh, Schulte Boysen, and Mildred uh, Parnak. Um, they also, I think, played a role in organizing uh, salons and, and discussion fora in the background. Um, but uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about them. Yeah, I mean, also the mother of uh, Hans Koppi, uh, um, she also was involved. Of course, I mean, especially Haro Schulze Boysen and Libertas. Uh, 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 they were uh, uh, a couple who were very much influenced by the 20s the, 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 that uh, in Berlin uh, the, the the Bohemia started to to what to to start a, a more liberated kind of life and also a different relationship between women and men so so uh, uh, Haro Schulze boys he told his mother I'm not thinking that my wife will do alone the household, you see, something like this, which was back then. I mean, it, it's still today something which is for many people uh, uh, not normal, but that back then this was uh, in a way uh, a revolutionary. And uh, so it was clear that uh, the, the women were part of the whole groups and played a very important part. Um, and in the case of uh, Mildred uh, Harnack Fish, she had the possibilities when things became really uh, very dangerous. And uh, uh, in Germany, she could have uh, gone to, to uh, uh, she had an American pass, passport mm -hmm. to the States, but she decided to stay not mm -hmm. only with her husband, but also with this resistance group. And I think this was a very brave thing to do and a, a tragic thing because she was executed like many others. So, so also for this reason, I think it's so important to, to, to have, a, 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 how, how do you say, a real collection what they did and to keep them in our memories because um, 
it's so important also for my generation our our uh, parents they were partly supporters of the nazi regime my father was in the military uh, most of them were afraid to, to stand up against the nazis you cannot blame them for this and there were only a few who said we need to fight against them and for us they are very important to keep them the, the memory alive yeah i think one of the your main triggers for doing this film was also uh, the uh, sort of historically changing perception of this group over the decades after the second world war um, and uh, it's only really uh, after German unification that that research on this group was sort of accelerated and intensified. But before that, and starting with the different, with the juxtaposition of these two films, one made in the GDR and another one in, in uh, West Germany, uh, is I think a very good illustration on uh, the problems of perception and of commemoration of these things. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem was that uh, shortly after the end of the Second World War, the Cold War started, you, you see. So, so this, this was one of the reasons also why uh, many uh, Nazis were not really put in front of trials. Uh, uh, many of the persecutors of the Red Orchestra from the Gestapo and the SS became members of the um, uh, German Secret Service, uh, BND. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the whole uh, his history was mainly dominated by their point of view. It's, it's those who survive, not those who have been killed, but those who survived and were in a way uh, also used and 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 uh, uh, the the allies they they worked together with them to fight against the communist uh, um, uh, east eastern bloc uh, so this dominated the the history writing um, until the 70s in a very strong manner in the west and also in the east so in the east the the um, Red Orchestra was seen as a kind of uh, heroes who, who work together with the big brother in Russia, uh, with our big friends. Uh, they were seen as the, the um, early uh, uh, protagonists of uh, the Staatssicherheit, of the Stasi. So, so this was also uh, uh, not they did not see themselves mainly as, as spies. They saw them as resistance against uh, uh, the Nazi regime. Yeah. So, and it was really after the Cold War ended, then a new point of view was able, and this started then in the 90s and uh, 2000 uh, uh, years and also two uh, American uh, female historians, uh, Shereen Breisek and Anne Nelson, they wrote very important books who were published in uh, Germany also. And they were the first who really wrote very profound um, uh, books about the whole complex of the Red Orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I have some personal memories, uh, as I told you uh, about this as well. Where, where I went to school in the northern parts of Berlin, um, it was like two miles away from a school where Hans Koppi, so the partner of one of the, the, the father of the, one of the narrators in the film, uh, went to school and a few other people of the group as well. And I had heard about the Red Orchestra in, in history class, but I did not hear that there was any link to this nearby school. Uh, but in the 1980s and the mid 1980s, finally, the school uh, took an active role in uh, commemorating uh, this group and uh, put up um, a commemorative plaque for uh, Hans Koppi. Uh, and uh, the other members of that group. So that, that shows that there was a real 
evolution in the way uh, this this group was was uh, remembered uh, during yeah. that time. I mean, actually, it took until 2009 that the, the um, what are convictions of the uh, um, of the members of the Red Orchestra, the death penalties were reve were revealed or reversed uh, yeah. by the uh, Parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a very, and you could say it it took. Uh, 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 more than 50 years, uh, more than 60 years uh, to change uh, this perception. That's really, yeah, interesting, but finally it happened, yeah. 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 Mm. Well, so um, you are sort of in the, in the <laughs> curious situation that the film uh, it has not yet been shown in Germany yet, but uh, has been shown abroad in some uh, film festivals. Yeah. Uh, what, what is your uh, perspective of showing the film in Germany? Yeah, first I must say uh, we will have a small tour through Israel, it's the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, hopefully will be uh, in May. Uh, together with the Goethe Institute and uh, my co-producer, we, uh, we had a co-producer in Israel, uh, Gidi Avivi. And um, uh, then I hope it depends from how the pandemic will develop. Uh, I hope in, during summer, the film will enter cinemas. It will be a art house cinema uh, release. And then the film will be shown on German public television, on, on a German French channel, Arte. Belgium TV is one of the co-producers and I think um, uh, Israel public TV will also broadcast it. Yeah. Okay, so something to look uh, forward to. Is, yeah. there, is there anything else that you would like uh, to highlight um, as far as you, your film is concerned? Yeah, I mean, what should I say? I, uh, I think the film is mainly done for not for a cinema, for a festival uh, a crowd. It's, it's done uh, for, for uh, uh, a larger audience, which, which and I tried to, to tell the story as uh, intense and emotionally intriguing as possible. Yeah. And um, uh, so from the cineastic point of view, this mix of fiction elements and documentary elements is not easy. They have a problem somehow to stylistically say, is this now, is it a documentary film? Is this a, a collage? What, what is it? Uh, so I'm very glad that especially there are several Jewish festivals in the US who screened the film because they think it's interesting and I'm very proud, I'm very happy uh, that the film uh, is shown, especially from, there's an interest from this side. This makes me very proud and very happy, I must say. Thanks a lot. Well, th thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, understand and explain the film a little bit more. Uh, and so once again, thank you uh, to all of the members, sponsors, community partners, and uh, volunteers who work with the Miami uh, Jewish Film Festival. Uh, thanks for the continued support. And thank you uh, to the German filmmaker, Mr. Karl Ludwig Rettinger, for joining us. And uh, to all of you in the audience, enjoy watching the film if you haven't seen it yet. Red Orchestra, uh, a very interesting film to watch. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.